So I don't really know how to categorize this video. It's a little off brand for me, but I wanted to talk about some of these artists and I didn't want to do a full career overview of any of them at this moment in time, which isn't even really what I do on this show. Mostly I just talk about the music that somebody released in the 90s, but whatever. I make all types of videos and this break from format can be an excuse for me to try something a little different. I just wanted to talk about this one situation that involved a bunch of different famous musicians. It's the drawn out epic saga of a defection and a falling out, a cease and desist order, and even a death. This is a mini episode about a would-be feud. By the mid-90s, Dr. Dre had seen his share of beefs come and go. He had famously traded disses with Tim Dog and Luke and his former cohorts in NWA. In fact, you can make a pretty strong case that the early solo careers of each ex-NWA member was defined by the bad blood between them. They dissed Ice Cube, Ice Cube dissed them back, they had the whole dispute with their management which led to the feud between Dr. Dre and Eazy-E. All them sucker ass niggas can eat a fat dick. Yeah, easy E, easy E, easy E, can eat a big fat dick. But by 1995, F with Dre Day had pretty much come to an end. Dre and Ice Cube buried the hatchet and even collaborated again on the song Natural Born Killers. And Dre had reportedly smoothed things over with Easy E before his sadly much too early passing. Generally, everybody seemed to have pretty much moved on from this sort of hair trigger behavior. With concerns over the violence, both fictional and non fictional, connected to the gangster rap genre, growing more and more hysterical through the years, it was a popular stance for hip hop veterans to display a certain level of class and generally just try to act a little more like grown-ups than they had in the past. Even in his songs, Dr. Dre was going out of his way to project a sense of worldly experience and maturity as if he was now above the kind of conflict-driven aggression that had defined the image of the one-time world's most dangerous group. With my millions, this where it's at. You got drama, I got the but we both black, so I don't wanna lay you flat. I mean, what's he got left to prove at this point? Dr. Dre was arguably the single most successful rapper and producer of his era, with the G-Funk sound that he pioneered pretty much dominating the industry. And so what if he didn't write all of his own verses? He was the rare personality whose mere presence was money, as close to a solid gold guarantee of artistic quality and commercial success as you'll ever see. So you can't quite blame him for losing the chip on his shoulder over time. At a certain point, when you diss Dre, you really do diss yourself. But not everyone was feeling this mellowed out grown man vibe. There were still those who never seemed to lose that competitive edge, no matter how much acclaim they get for their work, or how impressive their sales figures were. And nobody embodied this constant drive for greatness and respect like the then 24-year-old fire breather known as Tupac Shakur. Unlike some of Dre's former collaborators like Cube and Snoop, Tupac already had a successful rap career before they ever worked together, releasing three well-received albums on Interscope that earned his reputation as a fierce, skillful, and socially conscious MC. When I was young, me and my mama had beef, 17 years old, kicked out on the streets. Maybe, possibly, already the greatest? It was up for debate. Signing with Death Row Records to record his fourth studio album, All Eyes on Me, was a move comparable only to LeBron signing with the Lakers, the biggest star joining forces with the biggest team. The difference is, Pac was still well in his prime at this point. And the first single from the album kicked off this era with the biggest bang you could make during that period. A party jam featuring production and an opening verse from new label mate Dr. Dre himself. California. Tupac doesn't even show up on this track until 2 minutes and 18 seconds in, which is crazy for a rapper of his caliber. Now let me welcome everybody to the wild, wild west, a state that's untouchable like Elliot Ness. Clearly he had no fears of being upstaged by Dre or hook singer Roger Troutman, dropping one of the most instantly unforgettable verses ever written by a major artist. Out on a rail, fresh out of jail, California dreaming, soon as I step on the scene, I'm hearing hoochie screaming, fiending for money and alcohol. That's the kind of effortless confidence and swagger Tupac possessed. When you know you're the best, you don't mind putting egos aside once in a while. But as we would soon find out, that same ego can just as easily turn to wrath once it feels like it's been crossed. Dr. Dre had put Death Row Records on the map with his 1992 album The Chronic, leading to hit records from artists like Snoop Doggy Dog, The Dog Pound, and The Lady of Rage, which built on the label's momentum. Now with Tupac joining the ranks just as he is hitting his stride in fame and dope rhymes, it was a safe bet that they would continue to dominate hip-hop. But in 1996, Death Row suffered what would turn out to be the first of a series of major setbacks when Dr. Dre unexpectedly parted ways with the label. It was an acrimonious split, with Dre reportedly growing increasingly concerned over the violent and criminal behavior instigated by Death Row owner Suge Knight. Dre would go on to start his own label, Aftermath Records, but not before making his first post-Death Row appearance on record as one of the rappers featured in the song No Diggity by the R&B group Blackstreet. Ooh. 
It's going down, fade to Black Street. The homies got at me, collab creations, bump like acne. I don't want to stray too far off topic here, but fun fact. I was originally going to do a video about Blackstreet, but it soon became apparent that this is the only song anybody knows by them. Which is weird, because they were a very popular group that had a whole string of hit singles. But if I played any of those other songs in this video, 96% of you would probably not recognize them. 96% of all four of you. But No Diggity, that's a song everyone knows. Whether you're more familiar with the original or with one of the bajillion cover versions white people have performed of it for some reason. Does that technically make Blackstreet a one-hit wonder? I don't understand the question, and I won't respond to it. So we've established that everybody knows this song, but does everybody know that Dr. Dre does a verse on it? Maybe, but it doesn't seem to be the first thing about this song that people think of, despite being the opening verse. Still moving this flavor with, with the, the homies Black Street and Teddy, the original rough shaker. It's not the most memorable appearance, that's for sure. Anyone looking for a passing reference to the drama surrounding the situation with this former label would have to read way too much into it, and some have. There's maybe a possible subliminal diss directed at Snoop Dogg here. As long as my critic can vouch a dog couldn't catch me say But that seems like a reach to me. There's also a Apparently a rumor that Dr. Dre actually ghost produced this track and had even previously offered it to Tupac before giving it to Blackstreet instead. But that rumor doesn't seem to have ever been confirmed or even addressed by anyone involved. It does sound vaguely similar to his musical style, and if he really did produce, then that would account for his otherwise lackluster performance on vocals. But personally, I don't buy it. What you need to remember is that by this time, pretty much everyone was jacking Dre's production style. That was just the sound of mainstream pop and R&B in the 90s. But there's one little factor that continually fuels the rumor, and that's Tupac decision to record his own response to this song. Tupac's next album on Death Row, recorded under the name Machiavelli, contained several shots at Dre, one of which was a completely unprovoked homophobic attack in the closing moments of the song To Live and Die in L.A. LA. California love part motherfucking two when I'm gay ass Dre. But it's on the first single Toss It Up that he really goes in, calling out Dre for abandoning his roots and implying that leaving Death Row is a stupid decision for his career. Quick to jump shit, pump trick, what a dumb move, cross Death Row, now who you gonna run to? If that beat sounds a little familiar, yeah, that's essentially the same backing track as No Data. You know what? I like the play. Well, your body really drives you crazy. It's missing the big, forceful, low piano chord stomping hook, but otherwise it's pretty much identical. Of course, that exact hook is a big part of the entire appeal of No Diggity, so that means Toss It Up can't help but feel like a weaker version of the same beat. In fact, the original recording of the song was reportedly much more similar to No Diggity, but they had to make changes to it after Death Row received a cease and desist order from Blackstreet's lawyers, prohibiting them from releasing the song as is. For the record, the music for both tracks is mainly built on a sample of Grandma's Hands by Bill Withers. What really weirds me out about the whole thing is that Toss It Up was officially released before No Diggity by about four days. I don't know how they got to hear the song early enough before its release that they had time to write and record a diss track in response, but it must have been thrown together real quick. Honestly, the structure of this track is kind of a mess. If you just listen to the song knowing nothing about it, the diss seems to come out of nowhere, because it actually starts as a sex jam of all things. Lord have mercy, Father, help us all. Since you supplied your phone number, I can't help but call. Time there isn't really much of a hook. It just immediately kicks off with a rap verse from Tupac that has nothing to do with Dre, before going into an extended R&B break from some combination of Casey and JoJo, Aaron Hall, and Danny Boy. After that, we get to the Dre dissing verse, some ad-libs on the fade out, and then the song just ends. And this is the part of it for me that lends credence to the idea that this beat was originally intended for Tupac, because it's almost as if halfway through recording the song, they decided to change the subject to shoehorn in the beef. Especially with the presence of Casey and JoJo, this song sounds like it was originally supposed to be the spiritual successor to one of Pac's biggest previous hits, How Do You Want It? I don't know if I would ever say that Pac ever did actual love songs per se, but he did make a bunch of songs about romancing the ladies, and this was probably his most successful. But what's interesting about both of these songs is that they start out like normal gangsters need love tracks before making hard left turns into basically Pac just taking shots at people he doesn't like. One verse you're like, Now if you wanna roll with me, then here's your chance to an 80 on the freeway, police catch me if you can. Then the next verse, suddenly he's all like, Bill Clinton, Mr. Bob Doe, you're too old to understand the way the game's so, you're lame so. Then he goes and does the same thing on Toss It Up, albeit in a much more pointed manner. Part of me actually wonders how sincerely this is meant to be taken. Pac is known for some of the hardest, most vicious disses ever recorded by any rapper. When he let off on you, shots got fired. 
sometimes literally. Comparatively, Dre gets off relatively easy here. Aside from yet another homophobic insult directed at him, Tupac's diss on Toss It Up feels somewhat tame. Screaming confident, but you can't return. You ain't heard brothers piss cause you switched and escaped to the verse. Mostly, he just sticks to criticizing Dre from a professional and business standpoint. In fact, according to some sources, the actual motivation for dissing Dre turned out to be something that never even comes up on the record. Apparently, Pac felt that Dre wasn't there for Snoop when the latter was implicated in a murder charge back in 1993. Snoop ended up being acquitted, but Dre had stayed out of the trial completely and even seemed to be dissing himself musically during this time. And according to this theory, Pac was upset because Dre could have easily provided Snoop with an alibi. Then again, according to other sources, the only reason Pac went after Dre was because of the falling out between him and Suge Knight, which is admittedly an idea that tracks with the substance of the diss. Whatever the cause, the resulting song amounted to a huge slam on Dr. Dre out of nowhere. Historically, Dre was known to answer back on disses, but to this day, I don't think he's ever even addressed this one, and he certainly never responded on record. There was a simple reason for that. Tupac Shakur had died on September 13, 1996, after sustaining multiple gunshot wounds from a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas. There's no telling whether Dre would have stayed on the high road if things had turned out different, but there's no way in hell he's going to be kicking in any dirt on the grave of one of the most beloved rappers who ever lived now that he was gone. Although I do find it interesting that when Dre did eventually make a proper comeback responding to his critics, he seemed to have regained the old chip on his shoulder. You better bow down on both knees. Who you think taught you to smoke trees? Who you think brought you to ODs? Would he have gone after Tupac with such ferocity if he had still been alive? I'm not much for what-if games, but my guess is that they would have eventually made peace and collaborated together again. That's all for today. Thank you for watching this. I know this video is kind of a break from what I normally do here, but I've kind of been in a funk with creating videos and wanted to see if I could get out of it by trying something different. I'll get back to making my regular videos here soon, and until then, I'll see you sometime in the future.